Good morning, everyone. How are you? <laughs> On behalf of the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2023 European Animal Rights Law Conference. Uh, my name is Raphael Fizel. I am a fellow in law at Jesus College and the executive director of the Cambridge Center. Um, this is our fourth installment of the European Animal Rights Law Conference. Time flies. We started in 2019. There's a bit of a gap due to COVID, and now we're in a new venue. So hopefully uh, you're enjoying this new space. As of first this year, we decided to um, have this conference on a particular theme, namely the theme of animal rights in litigation. In the next few minutes, I want to tell you a bit more about why we think this is a particularly fruitful theme to focus on this year. But before I do so, I'd like to say thanks to a couple of people and organizations uh, without whose help we would not be sitting here today. <coughs> we are first of all grateful to the sponsor of this conference, the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy. <coughs> The Brooks Institute has been our most generous sponsor since we launched the Centre uh, and they've helped us make this conference here the European Animal Rights Law Conference and we're really proud of that so thanks very much Tim and Sarah for your support. Yeah. We are also grateful to our other donors, the Jeremy Collar Foundation and ISAR. With our theme being animal rights in litigation, we are particularly honored to have four distinguished guests with us this weekend. To discuss the groundbreaking cases they decided, we are joined this weekend by Judge Maria Alejandra Mauricio of the Third Court of Guarantees of the Judiciary in Mendoza, Argentina. Judge Atar Minala of the Supreme Court of Pakistan and Judge Carla Andrade Cuevedo of the Constitutional Court of Ecuador. Uh, we also have the immense pleasure of having uh, Lord Justice Rabinder Singh of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales join us later today. Lord Justice Singh will be moderating the panel discussion uh, tomorrow morning. We're furthermore grateful, of course, to the amazing scholars that are joining us from Europe and North America to present their cutting edge research. In particular, also, we look forward to the keynote addressed by Professor Manisha Deka tomorrow. To make a conference like this happen, a lot of work is required behind the scenes. And we'd like to thank our colleagues, Ava Burnett Kemper, sitting over there, our junior research associate, <laughs> and teaching effort <laughs> as well as Sabrina and Carly up there, who are uh, our public relations managers and are helping us. <laughs> helping us record this event, so you're going to be able to watch the, the clips on our website later, and they're also taking pictures today. Uh, we won't be recording the Q&A and discussion sessions, so just the talks themselves. Uh, please speak to them if you prefer not to be recorded or photographed. But Judging by how handsome you all look, I would be surprised <laughs> if you would take issue with having your photo taken. Last but not least, thanks to all of you, the delegates, for being here, for having traveled to Cambridge, and for taking the time to learn more about this fascinating new discipline. Okay, so why exactly animal rights in litigation? The emerging discipline of animal rights law is, of course, much broader than just litigation. As some of you may know, Sean Butler and I um, recently authored a textbook called Animal Rights Law. It's the first textbook of its kind, uh, and it covers what we believe are the sort of the, the key issues in the field. And maybe more importantly, you can get a copy yourself of this book. It's quite affordable. You can use um, the discount codes here. And if you're in the EU, um, I'd suggest using Amazon instead of Bloomsbury. We found that that works better for some people. But so more to the point, the textbook covers animal rights and litigation in just one chapter, chapter six. And the next chapter, for instance, covers animal rights in legislation. So the efforts in um, parliaments and other lawmaking bodies around the world um, to introduce statutes or even bills of rights for animals. So why focus on litigation then rather than legislation or other topics? There's two good reasons, I think, um, for doing so. The first is that courts deciding animal rights cases is a relatively new phenomenon that has picked up pace in the last decade. 
This slide shows that the cases dealing with animal rights were quite rare before the year 2010, really, with the first case, a habeas corpus case in Brazil, um, being from 1972. The cases we've seen, the sort of the rapid rise after 2010, is in no small part due to the active litigation efforts of the Non-Human Rights Project, with whose work I'm sure many of you are familiar. You see famous cases like Tommy and Kiko, Hercules, Leo, Happy, and others. But as the graph also shows, the, the Non-Human Rights Project was neither the first nor the only one to bring animal rights cases. Other examples worth mentioning include the groundbreaking Brazilian cases I've alluded to, as well as the, the Cavan case, the Estrelita case, the Cecilia case, about which we'll be hearing much more this afternoon. Now, some of you may object to this timeline, and you might say, well, don't cases involve animal rights go back much further than 1972? And aren't there many more than what I have on this slide here? You might say, well, there's countless animal welfare cases, and don't they deal with animal rights too? There are these cases, that's certainly true, but I would like to suggest that there's a difference here, an important difference in the kinds of cases we've been seeing more recently. And to understand that difference, I'd like us to turn briefly to the case of Bill Burns, which was an anti-cruelty case. Some of you may be familiar with this, this picture here. Bill Burns, depicted on the left here, was a street merchant in London in the early 19th century uh, who was caught violently beating his donkey, depicted here in the middle of the painting. This act came to the attention of Richard Martin, standing here, who many of you will know as the Irish politician and campaigner against cruelty to animals who was behind the UK's first anti-cruelty law, so-called Martin's Act of 1822. The donkey's injuries were so bad, in fact, that Martin decided to bring the donkey into the courtroom, leaving the judge with little choice but to find uh, Burns guilty for animal, uh, an animal cruelty or uh, cruelty offences. Now, could we say that this case shows that animals already had rights in 1822? After all, the donkey seems to have had a right not to be treated cruelly in this case. And wouldn't this suggest that judges deciding animal rights cases today are not that novel a phenomenon as I am claiming they are? To see why such cases, as Bill Burns's, are not animal rights cases in the strict sense, it's helpful to distinguish between what we call in the textbook thin rights and thick rights. Thin rights are rights that animals can be said to have in virtue of being the beneficiaries of corresponding duties that are imposed on humans. So, for instance, if a law imposes an, on, a duty on humans not to treat a donkey cruelly, then that donkey would seem to have a right not to be treated cruelly. In this thin sense, Bill Burns' conviction and countless similar cases were indeed about animal rights. But they were not cases about animal rights in the thick sense. Thick animal rights, I would like to suggest, are more akin to human rights meaning that they're not mere reflections of human duties. As we define it in a textbook, a thick right, among other things, is a right that protects individual animals' fundamental interests and that imposes a high threshold for justifying infringements of that right. In other words, a thick right properly protects vital interests such as it being in being alive, in having one's bodily integrity respected, maybe even in family or social life. With thick rights, animal interests cannot be traded off easily against trivial human interests, but they require weighty countervailing considerations to allow infringement, and they may even have areas that don't allow infringement at all. Bill Burns' conviction was not a thick rights case in this sense. This is because it did not protect a donkey's vital interests, such as in being alive or in having uh, his or her bodily integrity protected. And the same is true for the countless other decisions, other welfare decisions that involve thin rights. Of course, what exactly a thin right is or a thick right is is a matter of ongoing debate. I know at least one person in this room who takes issue with how Shona and I define the term. Shona Deniter, I'm looking at you up there. <laughs> 
But there can, in my view, be little doubt that the mushrooming cases that we've seen in the recent past are of a different caliber, at least, than Burns's and other thin rights cases or welfare cases, if you like. These more recent cases that we've, we want to focus on in this conference are about granting animals thick, human rights-like rights. And that what makes studying them very interesting, I believe. But there's a second reason to why we focus on litigation this weekend. And that's because we want to give a platform to all the stellar legal scholars and other scholars who have analyzed the case law, who have critiqued problematic decisions, and help push for better judgments, including by writing amicus curiae briefs. One of the missions of our center is to promote exchange between academics, judges, practitioners. That exchange, we believe, is not only beneficial for its own sake, but because it can help bring about better decisions, we think. Let me just give you one example. In 2014, the Non-Human Rights Project filed a habeas corpus petition on behalf of the chimpanzee, Tommy. Habeas corpus petitions, as many of you may know, are petitions asking a court to assess the legality of the captivity of an animal. And that animal needs to be a legal person, basically. The, uh, the case landed on the desk of the appellate division of the New York Supreme Court, which rendered a decision that's vexing animal rights lawyers to this day. The court decided that Tommy is not a legal person with rights because rights only belong to beings who can also have duties. The court reasoned that animals like Tommy cannot bear duties and therefore cannot have rights and can't be persons. So you have to be able to bear duties to have rights, the court said. But thankfully, numerous scholars, including a group of 17 philosophers, filed amicus curia briefs in which they demonstrated that the court's argument is about as airtight as Swiss cheese. <laughs> Scholarly refutations of the argument that only those holding duties can have rights have later been incorporated into more refined legal opinions. And I want to just highlight that of Judge Rowan Wilson of the New York Court of Appeals, who wrote a really powerful dissent in a 2022 habeas corpus case involving Happy the Elephant. Some of you may have read it. If you haven't yet, read the dissenting opinion of Rowan Wilson. It's really very strong, I thought. By focusing on animal rights and litigation, we can therefore capitalize on the insights of the leading scholars and bring them into conversation with the judges deciding the cases. Uh, to close, I just want to say I hope I've convinced you that these recent developments that we're seeing in courts warrant our close attention this weekend, maybe even uh, beyond the weekend. And if I didn't succeed, I'm sure that any of our other fascinating speakers today and tomorrow will succeed in doing so. So thanks a lot for being here, and I hope you will enjoy the conference. The overall objective of animal rights uh, of the center um, is to normalize animal rights law, to uh, make it a subject that people can reflect on, uh, discuss, consider, accept or, or reject, um, a subject that people can explore and refine, um, develop new ideas for it and, 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 and challenge ideas. And that's our overall objective. Um, and many of the things that we do in the center is to encourage and support that from our visitors program for PhD students to uh, our essay competition for school students and university students um, uh, and, and this conference uh, and the teaching and the research that we do. Um, I think we, uh, in the center, we want to support, we want to encourage and support teaching uh, and research. We run a a couple of workshops every year for law lecturers throughout the world, um, helping them, supporting them, encouraging them to teach animal rights law in their own universities. And we started that a year ago. Uh, we've had two courses, two workshops so far, and we have a third one uh, coming up in Warsaw, in uh, southern Poland uh, next month. And this will hopefully help to achieve our goal of 100 animal rights law courses uh, in five years around the world. We want to encourage students to take the subject. We want them uh, as undergraduates, as uh, master students, as PhDs, because we want to expand the body uh, of people interested in the subject, exploring the subject, 
thinking about it, which will only make it richer, make it more sophisticated, and make it more viable as a subject, because in many ways it's still a very early, a very early subject. One of the lectures that we teach is about what might animal rights law look like, and there are really only one or two documents available which look anything like rights, that look anything like a law. Most of the other documents are uh, uh, concerned with extolling the virtues of animal rights, but they're not actually laws, they don't look like laws. So there's a huge amount to be done um, in that area. We want to support colleagues, um, colleagues around the world <coughs> who are researching or teaching animal rights law. Um, as I said a moment ago, um, we, need, uh, we need you, we need academics, we need students and PhDs and so on to think about the subject because it needs refining, it needs developing. And I think overall, um, we want to support the acceptance um, of animal rights law as a realistic concept. Um, the, uh, there's a brochure on our uh, website that was written for us by a company in London. Uh, and I think the heading is something like helping make change possible. And that, I think, very much nicely sums up what we're trying to do, which is to uh, make animal rights law a reasonable concept and a reasonable uh, idea that could be turned into law. So that's what we're trying to do, uh, and this conference uh, is, is, is part of that. OK, housekeeping. Um, coffee, lunch, um, tea and so on will be upstairs in the room where you, where you uh, registered. Uh, bathrooms, lavatories are on the same floor, um, just at the top of the stairs, the corridor at the top of the stairs where you go down. Um, there's water fountains around the place, um, so that should be all right. Those of you using your branded bottles uh, for, your, for water fountains. Um, dinner this evening, uh, some of you have uh, booked to join us at the conference dinner, which will be in the main, uh, main building of Clare College um, over the other side of the road. Um, those of you who have breakfast, it's in the same, same building and same general, I think it's in the same quadrangle. Um, so that's dinner tonight. Those of you uh, not, uh, I think the back of the conference program has got lots of nice restaurants that Ava's found in Cambridge uh, that I'm sure uh, will be pleased to see you. Um, tomorrow, similar format today, I think we start a little bit later uh, and we'll finish a little bit earlier. Um, I think that's all for logistics. Um, other than sound, absolutely delighted. Um, this is our largest conference so far, I think approaching just under 100 people. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>